is up, Mets fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Mets Up Podcast, episode number 175. A uh, little bit of a remote episode here. I'm currently in Florida, been hanging out at the World Baseball Classic. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about the World Baseball Classic. We're going to talk about Mets spring training. A lot of news has been going on in the Mets world. Not necessarily the greatest, so we'll we'll go over that and what everything means uh, moving forward, as well as we have a little bit of a fun little bit we're going to do at the end where we're it's March Madness season, jersey brackets. We're going to take all the best Mets jerseys as ranked by the committee which was, uh, you know, John, Johnny Stats. He ranked them 1 through 16. We're going to go through our bracket, tell you who we think moves on, and ultimately give you who we think is the best Mets jersey of all time. Of course, I'm here with James. We're going to be talking about everything. You guys know the drill from here on out. Make sure you follow us on all our social media, at MetsUp on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. If you're looking for the YouTube version, go to the YouTube uh, New York Mets YouTube channel. Subscribe over there. And if you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download, and subscribe. James, how's uh, how's New York right now? Is it is it like eighty degrees and sunny like it is in Florida? It's been so cold this week in New York. You got out of the great time. It was snowing today, which was bizarre. <laughs> it's crazy that we went through daylight savings and now it's like been one of the coldest weeks we've had of the entire winter. It literally sounds like I couldn't have picked a better time to come to Florida. Yeah, legit. It's light right now. Like I'm staring out my window. It's light, and there's like some just snow just like swirling through the sky. Yeah, no, definitely not jealous. Definitely not jealous. Just for some, you know, so you know what's going on here in Boca Raton. It's uh, 75 degrees. Got a little chilly, so I threw a sweatshirt on because the breeze was Ooh. really kicking up a little bit. Uh, had a great day watching baseball at the World Baseball Classic and can't complain. Can't complain about the Florida life right now. It's going to take like a full month from right now for you to have been to City Field more than you're going to be at Lone Depot Park in the month of March. <laughs> You really get to know that place. I mean, I am getting to know it, and it is a fine ballpark. I think it's okay. I guess we could talk about that real quick. Lone Depot is fine. Uh, the World Baseball Classic makes it really cool because the actual event's awesome, and the atmosphere has been incredible, and the games have been really good. But Lone Depot as a park itself is is pretty boring, but I think I might just have a little bit of a bias towards these indoor stadiums. I feel like they all kind of lack character a little bit. Lack character? Do you mean just because it's new? No, because, like, I went to Arizona, and granted, it's the Diamondbacks, so there's not, like, a rich history there. But, like, Chase Field is, again, they're all nice because they are new, but there's there's no vibe. There's no feel. Like, you walk into PNC Park, which, again, is the one that I think is the best stadium that I've been to in baseball, besides City Field. Great vibe, great – I mean, the atmosphere is horrible because Pirates fans don't show up. They had a bad team for a while. But the fans that are there are great. The food's good. Like, it's just – it's a really cool stadium. Lone Depot Park, it's nice. I can acknowledge that. But – I don't know. It's not, it's not a baseball stadium. It doesn't feel, it feels like any team could play there, you know? Yeah. I see what you're saying. It kind of feels that way for most of the games that are played, but seeing it jam packed during these WBC games has been honestly kind of a treat. Just like seeing fans going back and forth, seeing the, just, I watched also with Vito the other night we were at, we went out with a, we went out to watch some WBC games, seeing the Venezuela Dominican game on Saturday night was so unbelievable. Just the amount of, not animosity is not the word just the amount of energy that every single fan was throwing back and forth in that game like i'd never it was cool just from the baseball element of it now i guess we're just starting the episode of wbc talk but the just aspect of like marlins park is jam-packed right now it's such a cool novelty it's so cool to actually see an experience when you're used to so completely the opposite of it yeah they're definitely not prepared um they definitely are not <laughs> ready for how many people have been there it's actually it's been fine but like the parking garages are a mess. Like trying to get out of that place makes absolutely no sense. It's like a jigsaw puzzle that they keep trying to jam the wrong pieces into each other. But getting out, traffic's been like whatever. It's Miami. It's still not New York traffic at the end of the day. The bathroom situation, you know me, Crohn's disease guy. The bathroom situations have been solid. I'll give them that. They have some good bathrooms there for sure. Bathrooms everywhere. But like the food lines, they really they haven't had enough people working. That's what it feels like. They weren't ready for about 40,000 people coming into the stadium every night. That would be my biggest complaint. But like you said, that Venezuela Dominican Republic game, which was the first one that I went to, uh, I think it was the first kind of big game of the pool in general. The the energy was unbelievable. Juan Soto hit that double after Julio Rodriguez got a leadoff single and it scored a run. And I, I literally looked at my friends I was here with, shout Dave, Enoch, and Ernie. They were I, I looked at them in my jaw drop like, wow, this this is different. This is a different kind of noise than I've ever heard at a baseball game. One. I think the fans are louder. The Latin American fans are by far the best baseball fans I've ever experienced in my life. It's not even close to the roof is close. So everything's just bouncing off. It's you're, you're inside essentially. So the, the sound reverberates for sure, but the, the noise is deafening. You cannot speak when there's cheering going on. 
And it's pretty clear from just watching the tournament that the players are treating this like it's a playoff atmosphere. It's like very clear how badly all the guys want it. We heard Max Scherzer talking about it today because there's been some discussion about USA not being able to field any kind of real pitching staff despite having most of the best pitchers in the world who hail from the United States of America. And he was like, it's just hard. It's hard for us to ramp up so quickly and like jump into a playoff atmosphere and our arms aren't ready. And he suggested playing WBC midseason rather than preseason. And I don't know. If I don't know if I'm going to make, I can't make a claim that that way or the other, but it does make sense to hear him say that. But then when you watch it, like, yep, they think these are the playoffs and this feels like the playoffs. They bring the energy. The fans have been amazing too. I think one thing that's been really cool is like you said, it's not animosity, but they're bringing like, they're going back and forth with each other. And that's exactly what it is. At the end of the day, everyone that's been here and is at all these games is there to watch baseball and root for their country that they're watching. I haven't seen a single fight. I haven't seen a single push. Like no, there's been no hate whatsoever. It's just been like, everybody's loving baseball. Everybody's going crazy. People are taking, like, Venezuelan fans are taking pictures with Puerto Rican fans and Dominican fans. Like, they're all, like, this is one of the greatest baseball experiences we've ever had. It's essentially the Caribbean World Series on steroids for them right now in Miami. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that it's in Miami. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 sick. It's awesome. So, I mean, I could talk a lot about this World Baseball Classic experience. There's going to be a bunch of episodes because I'm still here until the 22nd. So you guys will hear a little bit more, but uh, reporting from Miami, it has been electric. And if you ever have a chance to come, you should. And yeah, maybe I'll join you next week. Who knows? I got time. Yeah, maybe you come down and uh, have some fun, watch some World Baseball Classic. But you guys don't want to hear all about this. You guys want to hear about the Mets. And we do kind of have to start the episode a little bit on a sour note because free agent signing this past offseason, Jose Quintana, as we know, has gone down with an injury, going to be out for quite some time. Uh, of course, we, we wish the best for Jose Quintana. Of course, the medical stuff that came back could always be a little bit scary. Uh, but yeah, that it really, it stinks for Jose Quintana. It stinks for the Mets as well. It does. He has a stress fracture in his rib. That's going to keep him out for what came out today as being three months. They're talking about the all-star break, talking about the trade deadline, talking about getting an acquisition, which is always that those, that phrase that you're like, oh, God. <laughs> but it just it is more it cuts a little deeper because Quintana was a guy who the Mets did sign for his reliability, for his durability as a guy who would eat innings, take the ball every fifth day, kind of their hedge against losing Bassett and to lose him before the games have even begun. It hurts. It hurts a lot, especially when they said it's going to be a while, especially when the team was vocal about their desire to use six man rotation to take something off the shoulders of Max Scherzer, Justin Verlander and Kodai Senga getting used to the American workload, the American uh, five day five day rotation. So this does stink. This really stinks a lot. But really what this means is that there's now suddenly a lot more eyes and a lot more pressure and a lot more of an opportunity for Tyler McGill and David Peterson. Yes, 100%. And guys that we've spoke about at a lot on this uh, podcast, we also have interviews coming out with them, I believe, on Friday. You guys should keep an eye out for those. We're going to have some David Peterson, Tyler McGill content coming for you, which is going to be really topical now because, like you said, they're just kind of getting thrown right into this rotation and if I'm being honest, I feel really good about those being the guys that can fill in this spot because both of them have shown throughout last year and throughout their careers at times that they can be very, very effective pitchers. And what we've seen in spring training the last two starts from the last two days has been really encouraging as well. Yeah, it is pretty interesting that these guys have thrown back-to-back -back days with this news coming out. McGill throwing on Monday and Peterson throwing on uh, today. We're recording this Tuesday, yesterday when you guys are listening. And I think there's a lot to pull from each of their two most recent appearances that's going to be a little bit meaningful for probably how the Mets navigate this early season rotation, just how these two are ramping up. McGill on uh, Tuesday faced basically what's going to be the Marlins opening day lineup, Soler, um, Soler, Chisholm, obviously Avi Garcia, Garrett Cooper, all the boys are in it. It was it was what's going to probably be out there, something at least 80, 70% similar on opening day. And through four innings, only gave three hits, three strikeouts, one walk, no runs. There was lots of good there. The Marlins like didn't really hit much anything hard. There was a couple hard hit balls, but nothing was really like, you know, whoosh, like nothing was really smoked. And McGill started throwing this new curveball he's been talking about a lot with reporters that he said Max Scherzer has been helping him with. And just in the few that he threw on Monday, he had 10 inches of drop to that curveball going from last year an average wow. 53 inches to Monday, 63 inches. I tweeted about it the other day, got some good, good engagement. And that 63 inches of drop would have been in the, like the top, like 12 percentile of all major league baseball pitchers in curveball drop. That's not like the firmest number because that's literally just the inches of drops. That's incorporating a lot of McGill's, you know, his size into that, his extension, his high release point, of course, just him being six, seven. So we're going to need, I'm going to need like more things to populate to see the harder numbers of how much that's dropping versus the average or how much like that drop is relative to what a hitter is seeing. But I think it's a really good thing because McGill's a guy I've been talking about for years. Like if he can get that breaking ball to go along with his heavy fastball, like this guy can be good. 
One issue, though, about McGill, and this has now been true a couple starts in a row in the spring training, is that his velocity has just not really come back at all to where it was the last two years. He topped out at 95 on Monday, and he sat 93, which has been a theme, his first couple spring training appearances. But we have heard guys, including aforementioned Chris Bassett, former Met, Adam Wainwright, talk about how they're just here kind of trying to figure out what's working right now. Like, you're really not trying to gas anything up. Like, at least some guys, that's their plan. Especially McGill, guy coming off arm, shoulder issues. It probably does make sense that he wouldn't be trying to really push it right now, but we're going to have to see that velocity before opening day if he's going to be in on that team and in that rotation, you know? Yeah, I think it's important for that velocity to build up. And it's a guy, too, who really didn't pitch at all once he got hurt last year. Like, he, he came no. in, right, like, at the end, at the very, very end made, for, like, an... Ending, two. I think he also did make a couple little rehab appearances in the minor leagues, but it yeah. was basically months, months of inactivity before what should have been mostly a normal offseason. And I'm sure, too, I mean, we spoke with McGill, so we have a little bit of knowledge of what he said, and you guys, again, we'll hear that soon, Friday. Uh, you know, he's trying to, like you said, get healthy, get his arm strength back, get everything like underneath him so that he can be ready for a full season and not a short season like he played last year. So yeah, the velo thing is definitely something to keep an eye out for. I wouldn't say I maybe I don't want to speak for you, but I think we're both not concerned. It's just something to keep an eye out for in terms of we obviously Tyler McGill when he's throwing 97, 98, like he was at the beginning of the year last year is definitely a different pitcher. There's a reason everyone gets paid for velo. It's just better. I mean, that's, it's kind of simple. And the flip side of that is that there's a lot of research that shows the harder you're throwing and the more consecutive pitches you're throwing at 100% of your maximum effort, your maximum effort level, the greater likelihood for injury you have, especially as you keep doing that. So perhaps last year, McGill just was thrown so into the fire, pitching on opening day, taking the ball from Jacob DeGrom and Max Scherzer that he was gassing it up more. And that could be why his season kind of effectively ended before June. Towards I didn't even think that was like beginning of May, possibly even the end of April. That was that. One of his last games was that Philly combined no-hitter. So there could and be just... what You talk on top of it that McGill really didn't have a lot of innings underneath his belt to begin with anyway. Like, even when he came yeah. up in that, like, I don't want to say meteoric rise, but in that quick, you know, rise through the minor leagues, there weren't a lot of innings behind his arm. So I think, you know, a lot of it is just building him up to be ready for the full major league season, whether that's as a starter every five days or if it's maybe a Trevor Williams long man, you know, swing man roll out of the bullpen, whatever it is. I think, and especially with the conversation we had, it seems like the goal is to try and get him to be as physically healthy and ready for a long season as possible. Yeah, and it just lurk, looks particularly worse right now because these velocity readings are coming from Baseball Savant and they have their nice little tables, the player breakdowns for every single pitcher start. So you just see a lot of blue because last year he averaged 96 and right now he's averaging 93 and a half. So when you see like that dark blue with the arrow pointing down, everyone's like, oh my God, he lost the velocity, it's all over. But you're right, there are a lot of mitigating factors here as to why Tyler McGill probably isn't reaching his peak velocity right now. And we just simply don't know them because we're on the outside looking in just like you guys. So we can make our inferences, we can make our assumptions, and we just have to keep an eye on this and keep watching him next time he goes out there later this week or early next. A hundred percent. And we talked about McGill being maybe a guy who could fill in for Quintana, the guy who also has a really good shot, someone we've been banging the drum for seemingly for the last year now, David Peterson. Another great start in spring training out of him. He's just looks so good. Everything that you could ever want out of David Peterson, it seems like everything is starting to click a little bit, and you're going, uh, this isn't just a guy who should be maybe in the back end of the rotation. This is a dude who could be a legit X factor on this team. I, I can't believe how much David Peterson has developed in just such a short amount of time. It's really unbelievable to watch him in a spring training game against a Nationals lineup that is like at half strength. It's like 60% strength, but it's still maybe comprised of three Major League Baseball hitters, so it all has to come <laughs> with a grain of salt. But just like the things that he's done to change his methodology and his style of pitching are unbelievable and a lot of it comes from this new method of him with the fastball and the slider something we've talked about for almost a full year now his fastball topped out at 96 which that's kind of where he was sitting last year middle of the year and he was fully ramped up and he was like he was getting up to 98 so like that looks like that's still in the cards if not maybe getting another half a tick out of that and he was now throwing them again similar to when he was his best last year exclusively up in the zone he was just high 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 extension a little bit of hop and the guys were just swinging and missing right through it and he got six whiffs on 13 swings with that fastball again this is not this, this is not the yankees murderers row here is the washington nationals in spring training yeah. but the fact that he's just missing bats and like really sitting with with what seems to be kind of like mid-seasonish velocity is crazy and another big thing today that happened was his freaking slider that thing was zipping i threw out a tweet about it the first inning one of the first sliders of the whole game he threw was 91 miles an hour he had never thrown a slider over, over 90 miles an hour his entire career. And he threw one today, 91. 
and it didn't really move that much. This game was on SNY, which was cool. So perhaps, perhaps experimenting with a new color, or maybe he just gripped it a little bit differently to get a little more zip on it. But his average fast slider velocity last year was 84. Today there was 87, and he got that one to 91. And and he got four whiffs on it with 10 swings. He got 13 whiffs in four innings overall. So if you have to look at these two guys right now on the news of this Quintana injury, it really feels like Peterson is the one who's ready to take this spot. And I, I mean, you guys have heard me talk about him now for a while. I don't I don't think he's going to relinquish it. Like, I think David Peterson is really ready to make a jump. I think he's really ready to be an absolute difference maker on this team. And I think he's going to be someone who's recognized around Major League Baseball very soon. Like you said, the growth that we've seen in what feels like the last two years now, I guess, with David Peterson's game from when he came up till now. I mean, big, big shout out to the Mets pitching staff. Uh, uh, Jeremy Hefner, I'm sure being around Max Scherzer helps too. Like just being around smart baseball minds for a guy who clearly has the stuff. It's nice to see that's all coming together. And, you know, hopefully David Peterson continues to pitch well as we get into the regular season. Some other guys that maybe could step up too, because, you know, we talk about the Mets pitching depth a lot too. You got Jose Budo, who's a guy who could maybe come in. He made a start last year. Your boy, Eliezer Hernandez, who I know you would love to talk about because he's he's your guy, Eliezer. And Joey Lucchese is working back, too, from injury. So the Mets definitely have some depth there and guys that could also you know step in if needed. Yeah, totally. Budo is someone who was, was major league depth last year. He'll be that again. He just he has a very limited ceiling just because it's really only fastball changeup, even though the changeup is good and the fastball has decent shape and comes in with decent velocity. Has been getting hit pretty hard this spring, but it seems like he's working on a new color to add in as a pitch to kind of go in between those two, which is still sitting around 90 miles an hour and has a nice little bit of slide. So that's a good thing. Eliezer on the news of the Lucchese injury last week got pushed up to 50 pitches. So he's clearly someone who's being stretched out. If not for the sixth rotation spot, then the Trevor Williams role, just be kind of swing man in between reliever, starter, throw some soft stuff, get a couple innings out there, keep the ball in the ballpark. And Lucchese, Lucchese has been working back. He's really motivated to get back. When he was pitching two years ago, he was effective. He's always been kind of funky and kind of strange, but he's always been effective in the major leagues. And this is just a guy we have as depth now. So for these guys after McGill to be basically seven, eight, nine starting pitchers in, in organizational depth right now is a good spot to be. You wish that we had Jose Quintana the whole way through, but we don't. You have to adjust, and at least we are equipped to handle it. And as we've talked about you know, all the time on the podcast, this is why you sign all these players. This is why it's so important to develop guys. This is why it's so important to have a really full 26-man roster or even more extended, a 40-man roster, so that inevitably when someone does go down, when someone has an injury, if someone needs to miss a start, if someone needs to miss a game, whatever it is, you can have someone fill in, and it really doesn't – the quality doesn't drop far enough where all of a sudden the team's looking completely different – where really, you look at some of the other teams in Major League Baseball, you miss one or two players and you go, oh, this, this team's buried. They can't do anything. The Mets right now at least are starting to build that depth like you've seen with the Dodgers and the Astros and the Rays. Teams have been successful over the last three, four seasons, and you start to feel good. We have, we have uh, breaking news on Twitter. Breaking? It's, well, it's not really breaking. It's, not, it's, like it's just breaking pertinent to exactly what we're talking about. Nathan Gio, who it looks like is a contributor to the pitcher list or was just talking to Nick Pollock, he tweeted out a little blurb from, I think it's a Como article because it has the, it's very zoomed in, just one little blurb. So it's from, it just looks like it has MLB.com font and like background color. Just said McGill's taking a tip from Scherzer and purposefully scaling his fastball velocity back to try there it is. and get we himself have the to a spot where he can yep, conserve his energy for middle of games and to get the season going. So looks like we've got both guys ready to ready the rock and we've got a new curveball and we have hard sliders and we have, we have great pitching depth. Yeah, some other just, I guess, like little tidbits to talk about on the pitching side. Kodai Senga obviously had that finger inflammation or what was the exact words they called it? Was it inflammation they were saying? I don't know. I think it was finger soreness, the base of the base of his finger or something. Yeah, and that he expects soreness, to be ready yeah. for opening day and that they're just, you know, just taking it easy. It's spring training. Everybody, I, it's really hard, I guess, as a Mets fan or just a fan of any team in general to like hear anything and not freak out. But everyone also has to remember it's spring training. And everything should be taken with a grain of salt. And the, these guys, they don't need to be going 120% on March 14th like it is today. And it, you just got to be smart. It's a long season, as we know. Of a similar ilk, we have Bryce Montes de Oca had some forearm tightness. And some people got really scared on Monday, myself included, because I would have just been so sad if something awful happened to this guy after what's been going on for the last couple of weeks. And the uh, definitely not the worst has happened. He's just going to take a couple of weeks off and hopefully rehab and be okay once the season gets going. And you know what? Vito's cousin. That's fine. Yeah, Vito's cousin. We got a little, we got a little weapon that we can wait on. Exactly. Now, I haven't necessarily been able to watch every play because I've been at games in Miami. What's going on with Luis Guillorme and Kate Cavalli? Okay, that was that was a moment from today. Today's Mets game was one of those classic memeable moments where, for some reason, Keith Hernandez wouldn't 
like admit that Cade Cavalli is a power pitcher. He kept saying that like, Why? yeah, Cade Cavalli is a guy who's a guy who pitches, puts it where he wants. He really relies on those breaking balls. And like anybody who's like hip to the prospect world or like Cade Cavalli at all, she's like, oh, that guy gasses up in the zone with a heavy fastball. Like, of course. But Keith, for some reason, for innings and innings and innings, and Cade Cavalli look, you look good. Cade Cavalli has some really nice stuff. Um, against some against like again, not the most uh, not the most potent Mets lineup, but a few regulars were in there for sure. And this was kind of a moment early in the game where there was like a pitch clock situation where Guillaume was up, but we know Luis Guillaume likes to take his time. He's he's a very selective hitter. He was waggling the bat around a little bit, and the second Cavalli got the ball back, he was set ready to go. And Guillaume is like rocking it, rocking it, rocking it, looking around. And the second Guillaume picks his head up, Cavalli's in his motion and throws one. And Guillaume just kind of like throws the bat out there. He like barely gets the bat head on it. It kind of dribbles out towards uh towards the first base side of the rubber. And him and Cavalli just start barking at each other, barking Ooh. at each other. Guillaume had something to say, turned his head, and Cavalli then dropped a couple. It looked like, based on my, my talents of lip breathing, some F-bombs. And they were still <laughs> doing it. Guillaume was still getting him from the dugout afterwards. It seemed like Ooh. he thought there was like an instance where a quick pitch happened. There were still 13 seconds on the pitch clock. And you know, there was a little bit of animosity, which we have seen in the last couple of years. The Mets and the Nationals get into it with each other. And when you're like the worst team in baseball, like the Nationals, you have to find these little ways to like get at some of the best teams in baseball, like the Mets. So it's going to be something to watch out for this year. Cavalli did leave with an injury, which sucks to see because he's one of the most exciting young pitchers in baseball. He's like one of the few pieces of excitement in the entire organization. And he was like shaking out the arm, which you don't want to see. But it was an interesting moment to see those two kind of get after each other a little bit. Missed a little drama. Missed a little drama today while I was at Venezuela, Nicaragua. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I will say this too. You talk about like the pitch clock and getting ready. The pitch clock's so awesome. I I love these WBC games. They've been great. But the fact that like Canada and Great Britain were through four innings and it took two and a half hours the other day is just, it's just ridiculous. It's so long. The the pace of play in these spring training games might feel weird. It might, people, you know, a ton of people still hate the pitch clock. They're like, you're changing the game. Oh, it shaves like 15, 20 minutes off. But the fact is that there's more, the same amount of baseball is being played in less time. There's not any less baseball being played. It's just, hey, instead of having to dedicate four hours of your day to the same amount of baseball, you can now do it in three hours, which is fantastic. WBC has been great, but I wish they had the pitch clock for it because there have been some pitchers who will literally just take an, an, a walk around the mound, fix their belt, fix their hat, fix their pockets take the signs, not nah, step off. And it's like, oh my God, it's been a minute and a half. Like I didn't realize how much time was actually spent doing nothing until the pitch clock has been implemented. Yeah, it's just higher baseball density, like we've said. It's not like we took an inning off the games. Like if we took an inning off the games, no. I would flip out. That'd be awful. I'd freak out. That'd be less baseball. I wouldn't like that. But there's still 27 outs on both sides. Like that's the whole point. And Dude, we, we put a shot clock now, on it. It's, it's Bob yeah. Cousy when he was dribbling in circles, right, running down the clock when they were up five with three minutes left. There used to be no shot clock in basketball. I was I've been doing some research for NCAA tournament stuff for Mojo, just like getting the social accounts rocking, and I did a thread about the five biggest comebacks in NCAA history. And like the eighth biggest comeback in NCAA history was a seventeen point comeback. I think Cincinnati was one of the teams involved. I forget the other one in nineteen sixty three or sixty five or sixty seven. They made a seventeen point comeback with no shot clock and no three point line. How is that even possible? How, how bad, how stupid do you have to be as the go ahead as the winning team to let that happen? Well, eventually, they cut it to seven. Just stop. Just stop shooting. Just keep passing the ball around. Like, what's wrong with you guys? But it was, it's pretty funny to watch a sport like that and now realize like how far the game has come. And I feel like there's going to be a, a moment in baseball in like three years where, like, wow, we used to take how much time between pitches? That's ridiculous. And 100%. it's kind of cool to watch these games in spring training and be like bang bang out bang bang out but it's going to add this little cat and mouse element that i think a lot of people aren't totally ready for that maybe this situation just kind of pulls on this cavalli Guillaume thing where the younger players actually have significantly more experience with this than more the veterans because they've been using it in the minor leagues in the fall league for the last few years so they kind of have been practicing how to play this game with hitters while hitters in the major leagues are very much used to being able to do absolutely their own thing which that is that just kind of came to me in the moment. That's going to be a cool thing to watch early in the season. Well, we even saw it a little bit, I guess, on the other side where Scherzer was trying to like figure out how he could. I don't want to say cheat the system, but cheat the system a little bit of like, what can I edge. get away with? What, what? Yeah, what edge can I gain? How much can I make these guys wait? How much after the clock expires do I actually have to throw the ball? It's going to bring a really cool element to the game, along with just make it faster. And I, I don't think there's any problem with that. Especially, I don't know. It's just baseball's fun. I don't need to see it for four hours for the same amount of action that we would see in three hours. That's just, just where we stand. I told you, what, are we going to save 54 hours about Our on losses. average over the Typically, season? Yeah. Uh, based on how many minutes should be shaved off of each game? It's going to be about 54 hours. 
it's two full days you get back to your life. I love baseball, but two extra days, it's great. The Mets are going out west like the third week, second week of April. So going about twelve thirty instead of one fifteen is going to be a huge difference. <laughs> yeah, that's that's huge. That's huge for sure. Uh, we got anything else to talk about in Mets world, or is it time to uh, bring in Johnny Stats over here and start talking about some? March Madness, except with Mets jerseys. Yeah, Johnny Brooklyn. Let me yell about the Hoosiers before they lose. Johnny Hoosiers. There he is. All right. Johnny all Hoosiers. right. First things first. First things first. Uh, great to be with you guys. Uh, it's been a yes. little bit, so I'm happy to be here. Um, I know that the listeners love when we talk college sports. So no, they actually hate it. So we will uh, <laughs> we will try to not make this too college sport heavy. Uh couple things. Mark, I got a question for you, actually. It's uh, relevant sure. to what we're about to do here, the exercise. So we, we love Threadhead. We love walking around, seeing incredible uniforms at sporting events. And um, you're there, boots on the ground at the World Baseball Classic in Miami. So I got to ask, what what are some of the best jerseys you've seen there? So and why have I've you put them on cool Instagram? Ones. Uh, because a that. lot of them, a lot of them aren't Mets players, and I, I don't know. I felt I feel weird sometimes. Like I saw a, a crazy one today. Crazy. This isn't like a cool one. This was just absolutely insane. I saw a Yankees twenty six Saquon Barkley jersey. I mean, that's Ani Mall. That's Ani Mall. That's absolutely that's Ani Mall. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. So I saw that. Uh, I <laughs> and then in terms of like World Baseball Classic jerseys, um, I've seen a lot of Robinson Chirinos for Team Venezuela. That's been like the popular jersey. I don't know if the People selling them out of their cars, like in the parking lot, just have an influx of Robinson Torino's jerseys. But way too many people with Robinson Torino's jerseys for how many great players are on Team Venezuela. That one's been uh, blowing my mind. What has been really cool is seeing all the Winter League jerseys that have been there because you have the Dominican, mm. Puerto Rico, Venezuela. So you see like Tigres de Lice, you see the Caracas team, the Tiburones is another Venezuelan team. So seeing all those jerseys around has been really cool and like, seeing players that you recognize names with different numbers on a different jersey is also always weird. Can I ask another question about WBC jerseys? Yeah, hit me. I was shocked on Saturday when I was watching Venezuela Dominican Republic and I saw Ronald Acuña wearing a number 42 jersey. What yes. do you guys think about yes. that? Isn't that kind of crazy? I think it's awesome. Uh, the reason he's wearing it, I actually don't think it has to do with Jackie Robinson, although I think there's a little homage there, but I believe his dad wore number 42. So I think that's more what he's paying tribute mm. to, and I'm sure his dad wore because Jackie Robinson. I feel like that's yeah. kind of the full circle moment here. But yeah, seeing him run out with 42 is so bizarre, just because we're so used weird. to his number with the Braves. And I've just ne- you we our whole lives like besides Mariano, none of us have ever seen a baseball player wearing number 42. So it's yeah, just I almost weird the- to see anybody on a baseball field with that number on their jersey. Very interesting. Yeah, Butch Husky and Mo Vaughn also wore 42, and uh, Ronald Acuna Senior actually was in the Met system. So yes, a little tie in there. Uh, Mark, going back to what you just said about Robinson Chirinos, Robinson Chirinos is a low-key legend. So Vito and I had the pleasure of speaking with Jet Williams down in Port St. Lucie. And we asked Jet, who are some guys that you, uh, you know, you look up to, talk to a lot, have helped you along the way. Now, Jet is from Texas, but I did not expect Jet to say Robinson Chirinos, the catcher. Wow. And Jet said Robinson Chirinos. Um, All right. And... Did a little bit more digging, and Rob Torinos is a widely respected guy in the game of baseball, so maybe that has to do with it. But yeah, just uh, you didn't expect to see Robinson Torinos uniforms. I didn't expect to hear that Jet Williams and Robinson Torinos had a great relationship, but here we are. I, I mean, you you wouldn't be able to imagine how many Robinson Torinos jerseys there are. You, you're thinking there's maybe like 15, 20. There's like probably close to 1,000 Robinson Torinos jerseys that I've seen. It's, it's out of control, but hey, baseball legend, I guess, off the field a little bit too. Have you seen any, um, for Puerto Rico, Machete Maldonado jerseys? He's a, he's a very popular guy as well. No, okay. The Puerto Rico jerseys haven't been as much. They've been wearing like a lot of like the older World Baseball Classic jerseys because uh, this year they have like mm. the new one with the lighthouse. And I know because I ordered a Lindor new Puerto Rico jersey for this one and it didn't come yet. So you basically had to buy it at the stadium or you had to like live in Puerto Rico and get one there. Um, so there haven't been a lot of the newer jerseys because at the team store, there just hasn't been a lot of availability. They have simply too many like four XL sizes. And if, if that's your size, like congrats, you could, you could get all the jerseys, but there is an, there, the, the amount of those jerseys for the amount of people that are there, you gotta, you gotta be filling out with the mediums and largest. That's the most popular sizes need more of those at the game. Yeah. Well, I think the problem is that the mediums and the largest are the first ones to go. I mean, that's, yeah. that's obviously the problem. I percent run into that issue many, many times before in my life. So um, as you alluded to at the top of the show, we are going to uh, do a little bracketing of our own. Yes. Um, I am the one-man committee here. 
Uh, if anyone has a problem with the seeds, tweet at us. Come at me. I'm also Greg Gumbel here. Legend. <laughs> Does a great job every selection Sunday. Um, James, before we get going, I just want to say I did not appreciate your uh, your slander to the Hoosiers on Saturday for everyone <laughs> once saying, what did James say to you, John? Uh, James congratulated me on Indiana's uh, semifinal appearance of the Big Ten tournament, which was unnecessary. Um, which is as so, far as Ohio State got as one of the worst teams in the Big Ten. <laughs> yes, although they actually were very good down the stretch, second half of the year. So uh, I hope that if Indiana does fail to advance past the first round on Friday, both of you know to just back off. Give me okay. 24 hours, maybe 48. Um, okay. What about Sunday? If they also, may win one game, can we get at you right away? <laughs> if they win on Friday and lose on Sunday? Yeah. No. No. If they don't advance to at least <laughs> the Sweet 16... <laughs> Just leave me alone. It's the most wonderful time <laughs> I, of the year. What were we going to say, James? Can I say you something, John? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, it's funny. It's, it's kind of crazy looking back, but Indiana basketball was actually one of the main reasons I ever wanted to go to like a sports-inclined school. Hmm, it was really? I was lo- I was looking at colleges. It was the spring of t- 2013 during my junior year of high school, and I had a friend who was a few grades above me in high school who was at Indiana at the time, and they were in the East – Coast Regional, this was the sick team with Zeller and Oladipo playing at the Spectrum Center in D.C. I don't remember against who, against but Syracuse. they were... They, it was against yeah, Syracuse in the Sweet and I 16. I believe they were a two, and they, they lost. <laughs> and I was like, this atmosphere is unbelievable, but I can't go to a loser school like this. <laughs> okay. Well, I knew I knew it was going to crescendo in some sort of an insult. But being being there and like seeing, feeling that feeling of the atmosphere, I was like, all right, I definitely want to go to a college that has this. Yeah. Well, that was a special season. Uh, I was at Indiana during that time. And um, what I love about the Hoosiers, I'm sure you feel the same way about the Buckeyes and Mark, I'm sure you feel the same way about the Gamecocks is that I wasn't raised an Indiana fan. It's a team that I kind of fell in love with myself. And I think there's something special about that. You know, our dads made us Mets fans, and I'm sure that's the case for a lot of our listeners is the fandom is passed down. Um, But there's something special about uh, an organic fandom that you just kind of grow it within yourself. So, uh, you know, whatever happens, it's going to be fun. What I think we can all agree on is that the committee, <laughs> Vito, you can bleep that, Rutgers, how <laughs> dare they? How dare they? That's Jersey yeah. canceled. That's that's Jersey erasure. Don't appreciate that at all. Um, but anyway, I would put Rutgers in my bracket, but this bracket is all about the 16 greatest uniforms in New York Mets history. So, like any other bracket, we set it up 116, 215, 314, so on and so forth. I am going to throw the matchup out there. And Mark and James, you are going to debate. One jersey will move on. One jersey will go home. There is no NIT. There is no CBI here. This is the big dance. So, without further ado, let's get going. Our first matchup, the 116. There's only been one 116 upset all time. I don't think we'll have any UMBC here. No. The one seed is the Racing Stripes, the ones the Mets wore in 1986. And the 16 seed, the underdog, plus 2,000 underdog, is the 2014 orange Los Mets jersey. Fellas, take it away. Yeah, I mean, the orange Los Mets jersey, everyone remembers it. And I don't necessarily know if it's for good or bad reasons. I think they they had a walk off, I think, with those jerseys on uh, in that game or at least one of the games wearing them. Um, They're different. We don't we don't really get a lot of orange Mets jerseys. I think that might be the only one that they actually wore in a regular season game ever, if I remember correctly, because the other one was spring training jerseys and batting practice. But you're not beating the 86 jersey uh, just combined with the fact that they won a World Series that year. So it means a lot. It's an iconic look with the racing stripes. It's a jersey that I, I I own. I want to make sure, like when I became Mets fan, I was like, I want one of those. They look awesome. I think it's a great throwback. Uh, I'm I'm voting Racing Stripes here. Yeah, Racing Stripe is not even close. It's probably a 24 point spread. And they might even cover it. Most Mets jerseys is a fun novelty though. It's just one of those like silly things. And it's kind of a playoff. Um, they had a spring training jersey a couple of years, I think, before this, where they had the orange oh, jersey. Those were terrible with oh, the blue accents. Those are hilarious. Oh, the art how days. Those are the art how days. Yeah. Yes, those were the art how days. Yeah, yeah. Was, that was that was a dark time. Mess. That was yeah. Richard Dalgo, Mike Cameron. Mm-hmm. That was the beginning of the beginning of the Chris Benson era. Tom Tom Ty Glavin, Ty Winkton, Al Eiler. Yeah, the, well, some Piazza. That was that was that was slow Piazza. Shout out Mike Piazza taking Italy to pass the yeah. <laughs> to, to, to the quarterfinals of WBC. We didn't even say that. That was unbelievable. Led, led by their uh, their dynamic ace Matt Harvey, but I digress. <laughs> uh, it's e- easily the racing stripes. Easily the racing stripes. Moving on to the next round. The racing stripes move on. You mentioned the orange spring training jersey. So the Mets and Orioles used to play a lot. The Orioles called Fort Lauderdale their spring training home. 
And um, whenever the two teams would get together, it was way too much orange on the diamond. So that was yeah. uh, that was always terrible on the eyes. Okay, so the Racing Stripes move on. Now we move on to the 8-9 matchup, which is a battle between the Ice Cream Alternate jerseys and the first rendition of Blue Alternates for younger Mets fans. And, I mean, I'm not that young. I don't remember these at all. In 1982, the Mets debuted a blue uniform, which went away for a while and then came back in the early 2010s. So... You guys have had a chance to look at both. The ice cream alternatives are beautiful. Uh, what do you guys think? I, I will say that you you mentioned the fact that this jersey went away for a while and came back. I like the pullover style of this so without the piping significantly more than when the Mets did bring it back as like a button down with the piping. Like this one was with the orange collar and a bit orange on the sleeves. I think is one of the most fun jerseys the Mets actually have had, and I'm. I like these ice cream ones a lot as a novelty. I think they're hysterical with white hats. I can't even believe that this is something they chose to wear. But in terms of just a jersey that I would want, I think it would look good, feel good, feel good, play good. I'm definitely taking the blue alternates here. Now, when we're talking about we're doing the jersey bracket, are we, are we strictly talking about the jersey or are we including the hat? Because, you know, if it's a full uniform, it makes it a little bit closer for sure. I think, though, the fact that that jersey that they do wear, it's, it's just a difference of a white hat. I think it does lead me more to the the blue alternate of the first one. Cause again, it's like, it's a little legendary too. It's the first time the Mets are rocking the blue jerseys and it is a really good looking one. Like it looks a little BP ish now, but I think for the time it probably fit a little better. And to me, I'm going to pick the blue alternate. Yeah. You don't see too many of those around city field. That's actually a really, really cool Jersey. Um, the problem with the ice cream Jersey is that you cannot wear that before like July. Honestly, you yeah. cannot wear that at all. So like, like Mark said, it's a novelty, but it really is limited, I think, in the wearability. Once uh, Labor Day hits, you're out. So I think if it was a hat bracket, that white Mets hat, incredibly underrated. Incredibly underrated. Like a, a good white Mets hat looks really awesome. But as a whole jersey, I think, like you said, eight's a, eight was a good seating. John, so far your seating's been on point. Let's see how it goes. Well, thank you it's very much. Funny. I appreciate own- that. Yeah. I have one of these white hats in my parents' house, but it was from my grandfather, which is where I get the, Met, the Dirty Mets hat I always wear all the time on this show and around City Field. Same one for this one, but it was just used forever to like, for some reason, my grandma used the whole change. So it's the shape is so out of sorts now. I can't, like, I can't fix it, but it's a sweet hat. And it's like, it's, I know it's, it's like sitting in like, my parents have done some work in the house, but it's like sitting on the dresser. And I'm like, oh, that's a cool freaking hat. Like, I wish I could wear that hat, but it's a good one. It is a good one. Uh, and who knows, maybe one day there will be a, a new version of it. So the racing stripe moves on, the blue moves on. They'll meet in the second round, but let's continue with the first round. Our next matchup is a 5-12 battle between the 1999 Snow Whites with no name on the back. The Mets did do that for one year, following suit with the Red Sox and the Yankees. Against the 12 seed, a two-button pullover from 1978, the Joe Torrey days of Mets baseball. Yeah. Oh, this one. This one's tough. Here's what I'll say about the no name on the back. It just, it looks weird. I don't like copying the Yankees on anything. It may be winning. That would be about the only thing I'd ever really want to copy them on is, is championships. And I even hate, I feel sick saying that out loud, but I, I don't like the no name look on the back for the Mets. It just, it's a very uncomfortable feel for me. And Man, five twelves, man. These are always tough matches because I don't particularly like the other jersey either. It looks like a pajama top to me. I don't know. It looks like like a night shirt, and they're both pretty bad. But I'm gonna take the night shirt because I think it's less bad. So that's where I'm gonna go there. See, th- this is our disagreement because I do like the white, the Snow White jersey a lot. I don't. I think the no name on the back thing is a sticking point. But just simply as a jersey, this is one of the first Mets jerseys that I like. I remember, recognized, took in. I had a David Wright jersey like this. Of course, when they did put names on the back of them, but I, I just I can't. I look at the 1978 jersey and I think about how awful that team was, how bizarre this jersey was. And I'm like, I can't. There's no way I could possibly pick that to move on to the next round. So we've got a split decision here. So I feel like the committee's got to just step in and kind of be the arbiter. Yeah. Um, this is what I will say. I'm going to give the decision to the Snow White with no name for two reasons. The first one is those are good days of Mets baseball. Robin Ventura yeah. had the Grand Slam single in that jersey. Mike Piazza was a Met. Also, the hat they wore with those jerseys, the black hat with the blue brim. Yeah. A hat that's been lost in Mets history. Me personally, my favorite Mets hat. I probably had about nine of them growing up. 
I don't know why, but my dad just kept getting me Johnny more hats. and more of them. Johnny hats. That's right. Johnny Lids. Um, great era of Mets baseball. A great hat they wore it with. You could wear it with the blue. You could wear it with anything. Like you said, the other one was a little pajama It was like they got lazy. Like they decided to start something with the buttons or, or not buttoning. And then they're like, yeah, forget it. Just take it. We're done. Um, and for me, like I need, I need all or nothing. So the Snow Whites with the no names are going to move on here to the next round. Now we move on to the 413 matchup. A matchup between the traditional, current home Mets pinstripes and the Mets jersey of the 1993-1994 season, really lost days of Mets baseball, where the S drew a little tail under the word Mets. Not the most popular look. Perhaps see the too that, highly. I don't know. That that jersey is not only like lost that era is not only lost in Mets history, but it's lost in all of baseball's history. Even the most devout baseball fans have no idea what happened from 1989 to 1995. Literally no clue. It's like complete, like complete fugue state fever dream for all baseball fans. With that being said, it's pretty cool that this Jersey was forgotten. Cause it seemed like the Mets tried to pull like styles from the fifties and sixties and bring them to the early nineties as a way to like, kind of make a plea to the 70, 80 year old fans that were falling out of love with the game. And the current home pinstripe is such a clean jersey. It's it's like a great jersey. It's one of my favorite mesh jerseys, one of my favorite jerseys in baseball. I think I think there's a four thirteen with without much fanfare. Yeah, I think this one's a, a clear landslide win. We talked about the one sixteen being rough. I think this one's about about right up there. Uh the, the home jerseys are so clean for the Mets. It's I know not necessarily like a classic look, even though it kinda is. It's just it's so good. And it's gonna be hard to beat that jersey for sure. That Mets one with the tail looks I mean, it looks like I could have made it on Photoshop. It wasn't very good. Well, you guys have spoken. And like I said, perhaps uh, perhaps 13 was a little bit too generous. Uh, the great thing about the pinstripes is you could really match it with any cap. You could wear the black cap with that. You could wear, in the back in the day, they would wear the black and the blue. Obviously, the all blue used to have a black shadow. Now it doesn't. Um, but one way or the other, just a classic, classic clean look. I'm glad you guys are in, uh, in unison on that. The pinstripes move on. Now we get to some tough matchups here. 6-11, the sixth seed, the blue road jerseys with New York across the chest, and the 11th seed here, the black road uniforms. Now the Mets did bring the black uniforms back in 2021, but only the home version. The road versions have not made it back quite yet. In the 90s, the Mets had a home and road version of the black uniform. So we throw the screwball in there, the road black jerseys. What do you guys think? Yeah, uh, to me, this is a no-brainer. I don't know. I I don't really like that blue road jersey, and I know they got rid of it last year. I think it was pretty horrible. I think it was one of the worst jerseys they've had because the silver on the blue with the orange outline, uh, sorry, it looked horrible to me. And the black road uniform here, maybe a little underseating here by Johnny Stats because I think that's one of the better Mets jerseys that we've seen. So to me, this is a clear 11-seed upset. The black road uniform was so great. Again, James talked about like remembering guys in this jersey. I remember like, you know, Jose Reyes coming up, David Wright. Those guys wore those jerseys at times too. Mike Piazza. So my favorite players of all time, easy choice for me. Yeah, I'm, I got to echo everything Mark said. That blue road jersey is probably my least favorite Met jersey of all time. I thought it just looked weird. The color combination really? was bizarre. And it was also like, those are, those are also not that great. Of, I don't. I just, I've never really liked the blue mess jerseys for some reason. I never. I've just never really found myself into that. And these black, except that the one, the old ones I love, but these new ones I'm like, yeah, they're fine. I don't know, but I like just the black and the white better. And this, this, that black road jersey, I also think this. This is like when Shabazz Napier got in the tournament with UConn. Like he, I think that was that was an eight seed or a nine seed, and you're like, oh, this is still one of the best teams. I don't care about their seeding. I got my eye on that black that black road jersey going forward. Could make a run, sort of like Rutgers in the NIT. Um, anyway, so what's interesting to me about these is that, you know, the way that teams do this is you have a light jersey and a dark jersey, right? That's home and away. If the home jersey, home team's wearing a, a light colored jersey, the Mets can wear, and Carlos Beltran, if you remember his three homer game in Colorado in 2011, they were wearing the black jersey that said Mets across the chest. They got rid of the New York version and they just wore the colored one that had Mets across the chest on the road. So you could take your home one and wear it on the road. You do not need two different versions of it. So yeah. kind of interesting how that works. Um, but I digress. It is the black road uniform that moves on an upset. Our first upset finally. And you know, you can't stack all the good ones. You need a little upset here. Otherwise it's not March madness. A three fourteen matchup awaits. And this is between the current road grays, a classic 
A very hard jersey to get, by the way. You'd be surprised. You go to the team store, you can't find it. That's a three seed. The 14 seed here is the Raul Valdez days, the cream pinstripe jerseys that the Mets wore, what was it, 2010, 11, 12, that era? Yeah. So that's our 314 matchup here. This is this is a fun one for me because I do I do like the road grays. I think the road grays are very quality jersey, but I, this goes against a lot of what I said already. But that cream that cream pinstripe one kind of hits me sometimes. I don't know. It's just super freaking silly. It is also a play like on the old jerseys. Like it feels like you're trying to pull some of that 50s, 60s vibes back in. And it was just I don't know. That was that was such a bad era of Mets baseball that it was good. You know what I mean? Like that was like. Let's sit back and watch Scott Harrison just rake <laughs> John Buck. Like let's enjoy. Let's let's watch Daniel Murphy try to figure that out left field a little bit. Like that was kind of what was going on there. It was just everyone was getting out there playing some baseball. And the road grays are good, but it's almost hurting me that there's not those are not my favorite Mets gray jerseys ever. Like I liked the late nine the nineties two thousand ones better. I'm like so, and there's a lot of gray ones on here. It's hard to differentiate. So. I'm 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 pretty indecisive here. I would lean cream if we wanted to do a crazy upset, just because I think that jersey is so hysterical in Mets lore. But I'm gonna let Mark say his say his spiel. I mean, I, if you've watched any of my YouTube videos about jerseys, I say I say the same line every time. I'm a sucker for cream jerseys. I'm a sucker for them. <laughs> They're just so good. Like I hate the Phillies. You guys know how much I hate that city. I hate that team. I hate everything about it. But their cream jersey is simply one of the best jerseys in baseball. The Cardinals got a cream jersey. It looks great. The Twins got a new cream jersey. It looks great. You can't really mess this one up. So I'm so glad I, I don't have to fight James on this one because I was ready to. Because I, you talked about you're not a huge fan of the blue jersey. I hate I hate the road jerseys so much. I only have one because I'm a jersey collector. Really? And it's, I don't think the Mets do it poorly. I just think the all gray jerseys for the most part look horrible. And I wish that baseball would adopt kind of like the NBA with their road jerseys where you have the white home and you have the color away Jersey to me. That's what I think is a lot cooler. Uh, I just, I hate the gray. I know it's a baseball look, but I'm so excited to put the cream pinstripes through. Cause those jerseys, like you said, James, they just hit different for absolutely no reason. Stupid, but they're great. Yeah. I think, I think they would have been a lot more popular if the era in which the Mets wore them for sure. was better. Um, and I'm glad you guys both agree. Cause I was going to push the creams through and it's only nice. because Whenever I have myself a nice Saturday afternoon and I need a, a jersey, Saturday. a fun jersey to lose a couple buttons on, you guys know what it is. Um, <laughs> I am wearing my Jason Bay cream oh. jersey, oh. and it's and it's a classic. I That's love cursed. that thing. I take it on every beach vacation I go on. You can catch me in Jamaica wearing that thing. It's a classic. So I'm glad the cream's moved on. Like I said, um, it was just the era. But you know what? Maybe we try it again and things are better. So. The Creams move on a four, a 14 beating a three back to back upsets that will loom large in later rounds. Now we have a seven, 10, really one of the hardest to predict on a bracket. The seven here is the road gray with block letters from the 88 to 90 range. And the 10 is the road gray with script. So the same base for the Jersey one with the block letters. Not like we have today, as you see right now on your screen against the one with the script, New York. So it's really, are you a block guy or a script guy, guys? I, this one, this is, this might be the closest one. This is really tough. Um, but I think that there's the one defining factor is the difference between the two. It's what you prefer. And to me, that script, despite the Mets never really wearing it again, that script just looks really, really good. Like there, there's that classic Keith Hernandez picture of him wearing it that I feel like I always think of when I think of these jerseys. He's got the captain patch on his jersey and everything. It does. It has the racing stripes too. To me, I'm going with the uh, the script. I think it's just a cleaner look, and it's more unique. I agree. I'm definitely going with the script. They have that big Y that takes over the entire jersey, which I think is kind of funny. Also, just hilarious to put to match up the gray jerseys against one another. Usually, you don't let teams from the same conference play in the first round, but <laughs> but John, Johnny Brax over here is making his own rules. And I think I think the script takes it. It's also so funny that there was a period of time where the Mets had two gray jerseys in their rotation. Like that would have made an unborn Mark seethe. I'm with you guys. Um, the Mets in 86 had Mets on the chest in script, not New York. These are the late 80s after the 86 title. Um, and I thought it was interesting to put them against each other because it was New York versus New York. And I was yeah. just kind of curious to see if you guys were script or, or, or basic block letters. So the script moves on. That's great. Another upset, the 10 seed. Now we have a 215. And 215 is really, uh, I mean, let's think about the 215 upsets in recent years. 
I could think of Lehigh beating Duke. I could think of uh, what's another FGCU. good one? Oh, Dunk against against Georgetown. That's another great one. The Otto Porter Georgetown team. Someone beat Ohio State. No. Oh yeah, it didn't that's happen. right. I forgot it about that. Happen. Yeah, two years ago, they're back in the tournament. Oral Roberts could it happen yeah. again? Yeah. Could it happen that was, again? That was awful. Well, that was the only it was the only good team Ohio State's had in the last five years, and they blew it in the first round against a fifteen. God. Happens. Anyway, the two here, the original black Mets uniform, not the same as the current installment. They are different. Definitely some uh, some small, but their differences, and the fifteen. The Mercury Mets 1999 jersey, which has started to uh, infiltrate a little bit. You see it in the team stores. It's starting to make a comeback on the concourses at City Field. Wasn't around for a while, but definitely a notable uniform. So, which will it be? Those Mercury Mets jerseys might be some of the stupidest jerseys in the history of sports. Those are un. <laughs> unbelievably ridiculous there's like nothing even mets on the jerseys they were like black and gray the hat didn't have a met sign on it i was like what the heck? what the heck is this and this this is this is clear as day we, i'm sending i'm sending the original black uniforms through it's not even close it's it's so these this 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 is such this so far apart is not even funny this i can't i would <laughs> mercury mets is funny and they have the novelty i understand them being a 15 with the lowest mets being 16 but wow are those jerseys silly and i can't i couldn't if i yeah. saw one in person i was i would just start laughing I mean, they won the Southland Conference basically to get in on an automatic qualifier here because yeah. they are they're bad. But like, it's one of those things where if they wore it once a year, you'd watch because you're like, I got I got to see what it looks like on the field again. Like, I think the Mariners, I think it was turn turn forward the clock or like Back to the Future. I think it was technically the theme of Major League Baseball jerseys that year, and the Mariners had them, and the Pirates or at least two other teams that I know. The Mariners wore them recently, and that's when you saw D Gordon rocking the sleeveless jersey, no undershirt, wearing a backwards hat in the field which made all the old people go absolutely insane because this is baseball. You can't have fun. But, uh, yeah, Mercury Mets, that's it should die here. Let's go with the original black uniforms. It's not even close. The best thing that came from that night was all the uh, headshots on the scoreboard and everyone being Martianized. I believe Green Man, shout out Green Man, everyone knows him. His Twitter avatar, Ricky Henderson, is from that night. And the other thing I'll say about that, then we'll move on to the next round, is I implore you to check out the Pirates uniform from that game. Absolute fire. Okay. Well, okay. Once we're done, go check them out. If they were in this, they'd be moving on to the next round. But moving on to the next round, here's the original black uniform. Before we move on, I want to mention the Cyclones are actually doing a a Mercury a, Mer- a Mercury Mets the uh, appreciation night this year, and they're going to wear those jerseys in April. Nice. One day. Yeah. That's fantastic. That is incredible marketing, and I I, I did not know that. I kind of want to be there for that. I'm going to check the schedule. <laughs> if time permits, I will be there for that. That is fantastic. They do really, really cool stuff in Brooklyn. That's it's awesome. happening this Saturday night, the, the weekend the Mets are in California, April 22nd. That's interesting. I was invited <laughs> to a wedding that night, and I don't think I'm going to go. So <laughs> maybe I'll be in Brooklyn, although it'll be cold that night. Definitely off the, uh, off the Atlantic Ocean in Brooklyn. But I digress. All right, the second round, the first matchup, the one seed, the Racing Stripes, against the nine seed, the original blue alternates uniforms worn by both Daryl and Doc, I believe. What do you guys think? Who's moving on? I'm going to keep it short and sweet with this one because we've we've spoke about the jerseys a lot now. Uh, it's got to be the racing stripes. I mean, they're one. They're the number one seed for a reason. They should be the favorites coming into this thing. It's going to take a lot to beat them, and I don't think that the nine seed blue alternates is good enough. I'll tell you this: I would take the blue alternates. I love those blue alternate Whoa. jerseys. They're some of my favorite mess jerseys of all time. I'm not even kidding about that. Whoa. I think they're vibrant. I think they're. I think. I think they're a good. They're a good cut. If I if I was gonna wear one of these jerseys, I would wear the blue alternate. Wow, it's crazy. gonna come down to Johnny Stats. Yeah. This, this this is Memphis over Purdue right now. Well, here's the thing. I believe ten minutes ago, James just said he didn't really love the blues that much in general. Except I think we were talking about the you didn't caveat it at that time. You didn't say that. Well, even if you did, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it both <laughs> ways. You can't. And the Mets have brought the racing stripes back not once, but twice. They wore them in 06 for the 40th anniversary. They wore them again in 2016 when someone's ass was in the jackpot. So how can the racing stripes not move on? I'm not saying that they're going all the way. I'm not saying that this is just chalk, 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 chalk. But I think everyone would agree the racing stripes move on to the final four. Now, who will they play? A battle between the Snow White's no names on the back or the current home pinstripes. This is... Now, this is one of those matchups that you say, man, this should be like a championship matchup. 
in the second round. It happens all the time in the playoffs. I think that if the Snow Whites didn't have the no name on the back caveat, I'd be much more inclined to push them forward. But them being this bizarre novelty, like this weird Yankee Red Sox kind of lore, I will push the home pinstripes. I think the home pinstripes Mets cleanest jersey. This is the Mets most formal jersey. I like the home pinstripe a lot, and I would continue. I would. I'm, I'm happy to push the home pinstripe far. Some would say it's it's a championship quality jersey. Uh, I think that the Mets home pinstripe is a very very good one. It's clearly my choice here. Like I said, I, I wasn't even voting for it. The Snow White's in the last round, so I'm I'm voting for the current home pinstripes. All right. Well, there you have it. Nice and easy agreement. No problem there. The pinstripes move on. Um, I'm with you. I, I honestly think these pinstripes are maybe the cleanest uniforms in the entire sport. Um, and you know, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of splash of color, some orange and blue, not like Navy blue, boring. Um, so they move on. Now we have a matchup between the black road uniforms and the cream pinstripes. You guys both really, really love those black, black road uniforms, um, and the cream pinstripes. So I'm curious to see who will advance here. I love those cream pinstripes, but oh, those black road uniforms, it gets it gets the good team vibes in there too. Like you said, the cream stripe teams were bad. They were bad. And I think on top of the fact that the black uniforms are awesome to begin with anyway, they're a little bit different with the New York across this, the front, and they were on some good teams. That's my pick. Uh, the black uniforms, I'd been fighting for them forever when they got taken away, and they're back now, and I don't ever want them to leave again. I concur. Black row uniforms over the cream pinstripes. Cream pinstripes probably would have had a little bit more of a claim, like you said, if there was any kind of success that happened in those. But the vibes of those black jerseys in the late 90s, that was something that a lot of Mets fans of our generation can remember and kind of started our fandoms. I'm, I'm taking them all. I'm taking them again. All right. I'm with you guys. I think there's a certain toughness about the New York across the chest. I mentioned yeah. that earlier. Uh, and it's kind of making a comeback on a lot of the apparel that's been rolled out this year. Across the, across the bigs, the city name, not the team name, the nickname, but the city name. So I like that. Mike Piazza hit a couple big home runs oh, yeah. in those road black unis. All right. The last matchup of the second round, the road grays with script against the original home black uniforms. This, this, is, this, this one feels, feels a little more difficult than I think it should be. I'm, I'm reluctant to have a... a a black jersey matchup together in the final four, but I just I have to still take those those original black uniforms of the Mets across the chest, the piping. I think that was a great jersey. And the road gray script was good, but I don't I don't think it's good enough to beat these. Yeah, I don't want those road grays back. Like I, I can appreciate them. Like in in this tournament format, I like them. I think they're better than others. But I don't. I'm not. I never fought for those jerseys to be back. I never said the Mets should really do a 1987 road throwback game. I've been saying they should be bringing back the black jerseys, and they did. Granted, a little bit different, whether you like the new ones or not. That's up to you. But regardless, they they simply are some of the best jerseys in baseball, not let alone Mets, Mets history. So or original black moves on. Well, we are going to have a matchup of home blacks against road blacks. The road ends here, the final four. Here we go. It's a matchup of the racing stripes, the one seed, and the current home pinstripes, the four seed, in the first semifinal. Both have pinstripes, by the way. It's just, do you like the racing stripe or not? Wow. Oh, man, this is this is like picking your favorite kid if you had two of them. It's, it's tough. This is not an easy choice. Not that I would know. I mean, Patrick and Albert haven't been born yet, but whenever they come, <laughs> one of them will be a favorite, of course. Um, but... Wow, racing stripes and the current, it's like, you got the history with the racing stripes, you have what I actually live through with the current pinstripes, what do I care more about? Man, I, I it's almost like a flip a coin at this point. My heart is telling me the racing stripes. Um, my heart's telling me the racing stripes, so I'm just going with it, I'm going with the gut. I want the pinstripes, I want the current home pinstripes. We're here, we're in the present. We've gone through that era. We won that era. We have to win this era. I want to win with those jerseys on. These is that's that's the cleanest jersey the Mets currently wear. I like that jersey a lot. I do love the black jersey for what it is, but that jersey is like the weekender, the Friday night, the vibes jersey. This is the Mets quintessential jersey, and I really, really, really like that jersey. And I'm taking the home pinstripe to go to the championship game. Wow. So I was hoping that would not be the case because <laughs> now there's a lot of pressure on these shoulders right yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, and I can go, I can go both ways with this. Um, let me talk you through my thought process. I think I know where I'm going. So the racing stripes, like I said, the Mets have brought them back for occasions twice now. 
Um, you've seen a lot of current guys with that name. I, you know, you see it all the time. My friend got me a Robinson Cano racing striped jersey a couple <laughs> years ago. However, however, the original pinstripes are just that original. They have yeah. withstood the test of time. They go all the way back to the beginning. They'll go all the way to the end. You cannot go wrong with the pinstripes. Now, some people will say it's a Yankee thing. That's not true. Do people say that when the Colorado Rockies wear their purple pinstripes? Maybe not. <laughs> no one cares, but... <laughs> or, or, no one cares. No one cares. Pinstripes are a baseball thing, yes. not a Bronx thing. So, I've got to go with James here. Okay. The racing stripes are great, but they were an era. They, they belonged in the era that they were in. They were an 80s thing. The pinstripes, they're a forever thing. So, the pinstripes... The original pinstripes are moving on to the final. Okay. Now, who will they meet in the championship round? Will it be the black road uniform or the original home black uniform? So hmm. much fanfare going through this here. I you see this is almost a situation now where we can have basically the two current most popular jerseys face each other or bring in a little bit of Mets lore into this championship. And if I just have to look at these and like really nitpick, because we're in the final four, he seems very evenly matched. They've both been hot for weeks now, both playing their best ball of the season. This feels like I just have to look at these jerseys and see what I like more. When I look at these two jerseys, I like the way New York looks and the way, then more than I like the way Mets looks. I do. I really do. Both jerseys are great. I have the Mets one in my closet. It's less than four feet away from me right now. But this okay. jersey with the... Okay. With the it's, no, uh, you can't keep your headphones. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, lock, I'm locked into the desk right now. I'm just flipping around to avoid the city sounds. But I, I like the New York more. I like New York more, and I want the road one to move on. Wow, man, we might be having a little bit of Johnny both ways here because I, I think I'm taking the original <laughs> black Mets uniform. Like you said, I, I say again, you're picking your favorite kid. Like it's, it's not easy. But I think when I put the two jerseys next to each other, which one do, am I immediately drawn to? I had great memories, obviously, with that that road black jersey. But that one with the Mets across the front, that's the iconic one. That's like when when everyone talks about the black Mets jersey, that's the one that came back. That's the one. It already won. It already is back on the field. The other one is not. So to me, the fact that it's, you know, withstood the test of time, it came back. How do you pick against it? This is a tough one. This is a very tough one. Um, you know, the great thing about both of them as a jersey owner is that you're drinking your iced tea at the game, whatever beverage you choose to drink in the promenade, no stains. That's yes. a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. Could be a little bit too hot. You know, if it's a July day and you're wearing the black uniform and you've got problems. I know which way I'm going to lean. And uh, I'll just jump right to it. It's going to be the home. Nice. Um, the home black uniform made the comeback, like Mark said. And that, to me, puts it over the edge. I'm an, I'm an owner of a Roberto Alomar black uniform from 02. I still wear that thing when I can. Yes, it might be a, it might be a kid's extra large. I know that. Um, <laughs> but it's original. It's It's got the Rawlings on the sleeve. And when it came, it changed the game. And keep in mind, that came first. That came first. It was revolutionary. So it is the home black uniform that moves on to the championship round, setting up. A battle between the current home pinstripes and the home black uniform, both of which are around right now. So you know what? That tells me two things. Number one, we're doing a good job. Number two, the Mets are doing a good job. That's what I know about this. This exercise, this is great. But Jersey propaganda. But this, well, this is also <laughs> tough. This is bad. It's great and bad at the this. same time because, because who is going to win? I, I don't even know. Vito, Vito, we need your help. Get in here, Vito. Yeah, bring Vito in for this one. Let's hear let's hear from the round table of what this is. We haven't heard from Vito. I'd like to I'd like to hear maybe Vito's plea for either side because I'm kind of torn here. So maybe Vito can sway us one way or this. the other. I mean, I'm a very big fan of the black jersey. I've been thrilled for that thing to come back for years. Uh, I actually bought the black jersey, the OG one, and I bought the pinstripes this year. I even bought a gray one this year. Just had everything on the table. Wow. But I think that original pinstripe jersey as everybody said pinstripes mean class pinstripes mean dignity it's not just a yankee thing it's a baseball thing i got that jersey 
with that in mind, I bought it in a Pete Alonzo because I felt that was the right face for that jersey. Mm. The black jersey is controversial. People don't love it. I love it. I think if we're going for a unifying choice, it's the home pinstripes. It's never going away, and it never has. Okay, I, interesting. I'm gonna have to. Te- I have to tend to agree with Vito here. Like I said in the last round, and again, I, I love these two jerseys so much. I love the black jersey. I really like going to the park on Friday night wearing the black jersey. It's a it's a fun feeling. But I have to close my eyes and think about when the Mets win the World Series, what jersey are they going to be wearing? And it's going to be the pinstripe. It is. And again, the black jersey is the weekend there. The black jersey is the party jersey. The black jersey is the vibe jersey. But we're talking about we got to play a game of baseball. We got to really lock lock down for this game. We're wearing the pinstripes. Wow. I mean, I th- I thought for sure the black jersey was going to it was going to cakewalk here. Not and again, no no disrespect to either jersey here, but when I'm thinking of YouTube brain, my tier list, if I'm if I'm tiering jerseys here, that black jersey's S tier. For those of you who don't know, that's the top tier. That's the, you, you can't get better than S. And the Mets pinstripe to me would probably just be an A. So my vote is the black jersey, but I, I think I'm uh, outnumbered here, unfortunately. Can I ask James a question about the vibes he's talking about? When you say vibes, do you spell it like with a martini glass and a Z? Or are you spelling it with an I-B-E-S? What, what are you looking for? I'm actually I'm glad you asked that. because I would spell it with a martini glass BZ cuz I think that's the vibes really going for here. I'm looking for I'm looking for some reggaeton, some hip hop. I'm looking for music that's going to make me unbutton my shirt in my 30s in I, and you know, anywhere. I don't know. Just that's a, that's what I'm looking for. Well, for the last time it, it comes down to me and this was not how I foresaw this going. Um you all make compelling arguments. Uh you know, the vibes are the vibes are off right now because I am so torn on which direction to go in. But I think I, I think I have my answer. And my answer simply comes down to this. I think that there was too much of a cry for the return of the black uniforms. Mm. And I, I like them. L- let, me, let me preface it by saying I like them. Great jerseys are tough. You know, they fit Friday, the blackout. It's all good. DJ night at the park. Uh, you know, it's tough to come in there when there's a sea of black and, and wind. But I think what makes the white home classic pinstripe so great is that they don't get enough attention. And that's what makes a great uniform. It's like an offensive lineman. (laughs) When you're not noticed, you're doing your job. When you're noticed, it's usually because there's something wrong. And the white pinstripes, they're not noticed because they're that damn good. So cue the music. (laughs) Cue the March Madness song, because the winner of the messed up Madness bracket is the home white wow. pinstripes. Congratulations to the jersey. One that shining the moment, have. baby. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I, I think it would be fun maybe at some point this year when, we, when we're on the field, if we could ask players which of the Mets jerseys that maybe they currently wear are their favorite too. I feel like that could be a little, little good content as well. Do they like the white pinstripe? Do they like the black jersey? The blue, the blue with the orange Mets didn't even make it into this bracket. So maybe some of you at home are screaming that's your favorite, but that's what's great about this. We want you guys to get interacting with us on this. Let us know who you think the winner is. James is going to be running a thread on Twitter, on the messed up Twitter, I think over the next two days or so. So you guys can vote on the bracket yourself and we'll see who the fans and who the viewers pick at home. So if you're not following us on all our social media at messed up, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, you'll be able to find that stuff. And yeah, I mean, bracket bracket season's always fun. March Madness is great. And I'm, I'm glad we could at least intertwine those two a little bit without making everyone hate us for talking about college sports, even though, you know, no New York team's really in it. And no New York team's Except really in it. I own it. Yeah, I own it. Led by Rick Patino. Hopefully they spend more than seven seconds in the tournament. And if not, he'll be the St. John's coach the next day. Yeah. So it's all good. But uh, I think this is a great place for us to wrap up this episode of the Messed Up Podcast, guys. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Remember to follow us on social media at Messed Up. Like I said, if you're looking for the YouTube video, it's on the New York Mets YouTube channel. Go subscribe over there. And if you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Odyssey, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download and subscribe. Follow James on Twitter at James underscore Shiano. And follow me at Giraffinick, Mark with a C. Tyler McGill, David Peterson interviews coming out on Friday, so keep an eye out for that. And without further ado, uh, we'll call an end to this episode. Peace out, guys.